I may lean on this a little bit. Somewhere in the 17-hour flight uh, uh, from TEDx in Rio, where I spoke last week, okay. to uh, San Francisco, to New York, to here, something got lost. An event took place in, in my lower back, which <laughs> has been a bit of a handicap. But I think the topic you're talking about, and I still on the, I'm leaving I'm off stage now because I had to try to pronounce it. It's called enantiodromia. That's no. is that right? No. no. I'm off the stage. <laughs> the stage is all yours. Thank you so much. Well, this strikes me as such a literate audience uh, that it's possible that there are people in this room who not only know how to pronounce an antiodrama, but know what it means. Uh, for the benefit of those of you who don't, my favorite philosopher still, though he was the first Western philosopher, is Heraclitus. And Heraclitus said a number of useful things, uh, most famously that you can't stand in the same river twice, which should be obvious enough, but it wasn't obvious enough at the time. But he also proposed that the fundamental underlying principle of the universe was something that he called an antiodroma, which was the process by which everything is becoming its opposite at all times. Which is the only argument for moderation I've ever heard. That is to say, that if something manifests something that is highly, uh, highly caricatured by itself, it will engage eventually in the opposite caricature. That which is peaceful becomes warlike. That which is rich becomes poor. That which is northern becomes southern. And we are in an age where an antiodroma is becoming increasingly evident in practically everything we look at. But before I get into that, I want to give you a parable. Back in the middle 17th century, there were a couple of guys, Sir Isaac Newton and Leibniz. Now Leibniz and Newton, oddly enough, came up with the calculus in the same two week period. This is not an easy thing to imagine happening, since the calculus, at least when I studied it, didn't seem particularly intuitive. But they both managed to reach that point where the human mind collectively was ready to produce it, and they did. Now, a couple of things happened at that point. Newton, spent the rest of his life trying to prove that Leibniz had ripped him off, had stolen his intellectual property, and actually didn't do very much important work after that because he was so embittered at this theft of his idea. Leibniz, on the other hand, thought there were plenty of other interesting things to think about. And among other things, he went out and invented the bit. I kid you not. He realized that the reason that we have base 10 number systems is because of these. And that it was arbitrary. You could have base 37 number systems. You could have base 112 number systems. You could, in fact, have base two number systems or ones and zeros. He invented binary math or discovery. 
And being a creature of his time, what he did then, <laughs> and it's a lovely thing that one could do such a thing or would think to do such a thing, he felt that that was proof that the Eastern notion of oneness, the monad, was wrong because the fact that you could create the entire universe out of ones and zeros meant that, of course, there had to be duality. There was the sacred and the profane, there was heaven, there was hell, there was, there was God, there was man, there was this and there was that. And he was so pleased with what he considered to be the ultimate proof of the Western way of looking at things, that he actually sent a letter to the emperor of China, <laughs> assuming that he would be the re best representative, <laughs> I guess, to, uh, to uh, defend the monad against uh, Leibniz's revelation. And those were the days. It, it took a couple of years for the letter to get there. And then there was a digestive process that I can only imagine that took another four or five years. And finally, he got a letter back, which was the Tao Te Ching translated into Latin. In other words, I see your point, but here's how we look at it. <coughs> It's not either or, it's both and. And that, I think, had it been understood at the time, would have been a real turning point in Western history. But because we then had Descartes and a number of other people that were really pretty wedded to the either or school, we stuck with that. And now I think, finally, having proceeded into the golden age of irony, and believe me, that's what this is. I mean, if you don't have a sense of irony at this point, you are missing almost all the fun. <laughs> or you're, you have a very tragic sense of life <laughs> instead, of, instead of having a pretty good time as I am. Because we are in a world that is obviously and manifestly both and, but within the dance of the yin and the yang, within that both and, there are some very important things going on, and one of them is the erosion, which I am pleased to say I predicted about 25 years ago, of monotheism thanks to the internet. A monotheism, and I don't mean to offend any monotheists in the audience, because I know that back these days can be <laughs> dangerous to one's health. Uh, monotheism depends very strongly on belief in one of three books. The belief that what is in those three books what is contained therein contains essentially all one needs to know about the world and how its cosmology is laid out. That worked as long as you had large chunks of the world where the reality distortion field created by one of those books was in a position to reign without much question. But with the dawn of the internet, that point ended. And the internet and its capacity to ask questions that go far outside of those books is really working a number on that notion of authority, which has been very popular here in the northern part of the planet, a very successful part of the planet particularly in this successful part of the planet, where the idea of authority is that, is that there's a great white column with God on top 
and you on the bottom, and nobody asking very many questions down along the line. Certainly not questions asked upward. That vertical system of authority formation is now under deep attack by a system which is horizontal and where authority is based on consensus and the collective understanding of reality by all of us who are now finally in a position to put in our say. Now I gather that many of us are devoting our say to World of Warcraft, which is everybody's choice, but <laughs> we're also doing Wikipedia and we're also doing the internet. And the internet is, I still believe, the most profound technological event. And I, and I start the internet clear back at that moment when Samuel F. B. Morris tapped out, what hath God wrought? And somebody 37 miles away at that very moment understood what he had just said at that great distance. But the internet is the most important technological event since the capture of fire in terms of what it does to be a human being. Because it creates explicitly the global organism, not of the unconscious, but the conscious. It creates what Tyard de Chardin was talking about when he, when he spoke of there being an evolutionary teleology that would eventually create an awareness, and he was a Catholic so he could talk like this, an awareness that was sufficiently complex that it was capable of keeping God company. We are collectively that, or can be. There are, however, some habits of mind. First of all, monotheism in its death throes. And as it goes down, it gets uglier and meaner and mostly attacks itself, fortunately. But there are a lot of people in, in the crossfire. And Hemingway once said, don't worry about the bullet with your name on it. Worry about the one that's addressed to whom it may concern. There is that war going on, and it's a dangerous war. But there is also a war going on between those who believe that the power of information lies in its capacity to be withheld. That information is power if you can keep it to yourself. This is not how it works, really. Information is power if you can share it, validate it, vet it, and contribute it to that global awareness that we, were all, we are all here in the process of creating. Because for the first time in human history, we are on the verge of being able to convey a right to everybody on this planet that nobody even thought of conveying before because it was simply impossible. And I'm talking about the right to know. Now I know that knowing is arguable. I know that the truth is arguable and well that it should be. But we are within a very short distance of making it so that some kid in the uplands of Mali who is curious about some aspect of genetic organization inside various genomes is as capable of becoming a world-class expert on that subject as somebody who's getting a doctorate 
And I actually have an example of this. There are a couple of kids in Silicon Valley that are starting a company where they're doing literally world-class Nobel Prize, possibly Nobel Prize winning genetic theory, who dropped out of high school because they found it useless when they were 17 and have done everything they've done since by studying everything they can get their hands on through the internet. When we convey the right to know, we amplify our collective capacities as a unified species into something that is very, very different from anything we've ever been before. Something very special, something very powerful, and something that may even be capable of saving us from ourselves, since we are also hell-bent on making our planet uninhabitable for human life as quickly as we possibly can. I don't worry about life. Life, <laughs> life would be fine. It's just human life that looks like it's in peril. You know, we'll, we'll leave, and as George Carlin said, it'll be the same as it was before, except with a lot more plastic. So I want to just close this conference and my remarks here by asking you to consider the possibility that the most important thing you're doing, regardless of what it might seem to be, the most important thing you offer is whether or not you're going to be a good ancestor. We have it in our control to be great ancestors by enabling the right to know, by freeing up information, by creating new economic models that reward sharing and not hoarding, that reward service and not the precious conceit that you can own the miraculous stuff that I think God puts in your mind, excuse the term. We can convey that right or we can withhold it for short-term economic interests. And if we do that, we will be awful ancestors. And if we don't do that, we will be one of the greatest generations that the world has ever seen. Thanks.